Hello and welcome back to the Center for Critical and Cultural Theory. My name is Dr. Roger Green. This is another lecture in our Introduction to Critical Theory course. We have been reading Carl Schmitt's Political Theology. Yes, I know Carl Schmitt was not a classic critical theorist, but uh, his book comes out around the same time that the Frankfurt School for Social Research um, emerged in Weimar, Germany. So reading him gives us a historical context for uh, why critical theory emerges as it does a um, hundred years ago, <clears throat> or just a little over a hundred years ago. And uh, Carl Schmitt, um, despite being a right-wing um, conservative uh, thinker um, who uh, was an unapologetic anti-Semite and Nazi, um, uh, has been widely read in um, theory circles, especially in the 21st century, especially in the United States, um, uh, both among people on the political right and the political left. So in uh, turning to Schmidt, I'm trying to uh, allow my students to see, first of all, what, one of the things that critical theory does, um, as Herbert Marcuse said in our first lecture, um, is that it tries to uh, address the present. And so I've been using present examples. I used some 24, 2024 election examples um, in my previous uh, coverage of chapter one of this book. Yes, I know the book was written in, in 1922 and we're in 2024 right now, but the critical theory angle is to under first we want to understand where critical theory came from, but it's also to understand like why, well, why is it that all of these um, uh <clears throat> Um, scholars and critics in the 21st century are uh, um, reading this guy from from you know some, from early 20th century from a really right wing situation, um, and and what is the relevance today? Right, that those these are ongoing questions to be thinking about. Uh, this will deal. This lecture will deal with uh, um, his second essay from the book, which is. Uh, titled I, as I'm pulling up the screen here to share with you. Um, the problem of sovereignty as the problem of the legal form of the decision. <clears throat> Schmidt opens this essay with a brief historic history of the concept of sovereignty as it developed within the new state forms in the 17th century. Oftentimes people refer to the 1648 Peace of Westphalia on this point, um, but it's like, you know, that agreement is important, but it's not like there were, weren't, wasn't like a 1688 like revolution in England, you know, it's, it's not like it stopped all religious wars, right? <laughs> um, uh, so it's just a placeholder back in history, but it, it's a common one that political theorists use for the emergence of this new thing called the nation state. So Schmidt notes that the concept of sovereignty existed in the 1871 German constitution, which had different states, but that those states did not have sovereignty, sovereignty at least not in the true sense that he's been articulating it in this book. Um, true sovereignty was reserved for the empire, empire and its emperor. He then turns briefly to distinguish sovereign power from brute force, citing Jean-Jacques Rousseau, quote, the connection of actual power with the legally highest power is the fundamental problem of the concept of sovereignty. All the difficulties reside here, end quote. So Schmidt then complains that recent treatments by neo-Kantian um, legal theorists, such as Hans Kelsen, um, that their treatments of sovereignty has made a distinction between juridical and sociological realms. As a legal positivist working in a liberally inspired tradition, Kelsen treated the legitimacy of law as a social construct. The social construct of sovereignty was too abstract for Schmidt, and of course had developed through social contract theories. This is why he has someone like Jean-Jacques Rousseau on his mind here. Um, so this type of thinking leads one to establish 
law on normative reasoning, leading toward the rule of law rather than the sovereign's decision and the exception. Again, Schmidt's a conservative theorist, and uh, he has an allergy or a distaste for liberalism and liberal democracy. But he's reading all of these legal positivist, neo-Kantian people associated with liberalism, um, and kind of taking them to task in this in this book. That's that's if we look at what his method is, he's he is listening to the people he disagrees with and saying why they are wrong. Um, this type of thinking also aligns the legal order with the abstract notion of the state. Um, and this is Schmidt's general concern. Um, is that if we treat sovereignty too abstractly, if we treat law too abstractly, if we treat the, the state too abstractly, then we don't know what holds it together. Over time, it becomes based on science. Um, and that's what legal positivism tries to do, is to see a legal apparatus of laws as something that we can analyze scientifically. Comes out of positivism more generally in the 19th century um, that tried to present scientific objectivity. Um, with relationship to various different subject matters. It just happens to be that in legal thought, they're called legal positiv positivists. So according to the thinking, it becomes a system of science. But for Schmidt, that system is empty of its foundation. Objectivity appears possible, but Schmidt sees nothing actually posited at the base. Liberals like Kelsen, quote, negate the sovereign, according to Schmidt. He then cites Dutch theorist Hugo Krab, um, who presents the rule of law as a, quote, spiritual force that replaced the personal force of the king originally. The state emanates from the, quote, spiritual nature of man, and people obey the state as a matter of volition in this thinking. They choose po its power based on their sense of what is right. Um, Krab defines this state as the disinterested production of law and nothing else. For Krab, all leaders of the state are subject to law. Theorists like him are reacting to an authoritarian state. Hugo um, Proust, or Preuss, um, <clears throat> or Proust, uh, I'll just say Proust because it's like Dr. Seuss for me, um, uh, um, I don't have German uh, really well as a language. Um, uh, uh, Hugo Proust, who drafted the Weimar Constitution, quote, rejected the concept of sovereignty as a residue of the authoritarian state and the discovered community based on associations and constituted from below as an organization that did not need a monopoly on power and could thus also manage without sovereignty. Um, so he's attacking liberal theorists in general um, Schmidt is, um, or critiquing them anyway. And uh, um, what he has in mind is the context of the Weimar Constitution in which he lives, right? And he's saying that the liberals and liberalism reject the concept of sovereignty. They try to eliminate it from constitutional democracies. And that what results from that is that we don't know what the state is founded on anymore in Schmidt's critique. He then turns to Kurt Wolzendorf, who had just died in 1921. And Wolzendorf had come closer, um, according to Schmidt, than his liberal peers <clears throat> to an authoritarian description of the state by saying that the state needs law and laws need the state, but the state must be a protector of the laws and the state must be a protector of itself. So if you remember from my last lecture, I was using the current con um, context in the United States surrounding the contested um, uh, decision among a uh, Colorado um, legislature where I live um, to remove Donald Trump as a name from the twenty four uh, uh, the uh, the twenty twenty four presidential election. <clears throat> Other states have followed suit to try and eliminate him from their state ballots, and the case is going to the Supreme Court for a decision at that particular level on whether or not this should be allowed. They're citing um, amendments from the constitution, 
the U.S. Constitution that were made after the, our Civil War in the late 1860s that barred people who had participated in insurrection in the South, right, um, from holding office again and saying that by under that particular um, uh, context, Trump, who participated and according to this thinking, um, and in, and uh, uh, urged on the insurrection at the Capitol um, in January of 2021 because he was upset at having lost the election, um, that uh, uh, because of that participation, he um, uh, has participated in an insurrection and thus cannot hold power again. Um, Trump is saying that because what he was in power at the time, he was the sitting president, he's immune from any of these types of charges, right? So he's claiming a kind of uh, sovereignty in his own um, ability to make decisions or say whatever he would wanted to say, whether it inspired insurrection or not. Um, that's just the current situation that, that I want my um, US students to be thinking about here. Along with that idea is the idea that it's the state the state reserves the right to protect itself even against people who might be elected democratically if those people and their ultimate agendas are to destroy the state itself, right? So that's where the the, the tension is lying. And, and, and um, I might have my own opinions about that, but we're, we're just going to have to see how things unfold in coming months in the United States. But that's why one example of what critical theory is and does and, and why it's useful for giving us an ana uh, the tools with which to analyze the present, right? Which is one of the reasons why I'm, I'm saying that Schmidt is important, um, uh, not for just understanding the emergence of critical theory to begin with in the 1920s in Germany, but um, to understand um, why uh, many theorists, both on the right and the left, um, have taken up to reading Schmidt in the past 20 years or so. So um, Schmidt associates um, the new establishment of, of just a completely sort of attempt to, to make complete objective laws with the establishment of the Soviet Union in Russia. He then turns to the muddiness of in definitions of form by all of the legal theorists, though. So again, he's not talking a lot about Lenin and the Soviet Union in here. I mean, they're like he he cannot stand that. That's the way way further left. So he's definitely against that. But his more immediate context is the liberal democracy in Germany. <clears throat> so then he turns to Max Weber's sociology of law, which tends toward increasing expertise and managerial bureaucracy presenting as, quote, rational. Another term for this, as I mentioned in the last le lecture, is instrumental reason. Schmidt contrasts various meanings of form um, in different spheres, such as the military as opposed to legal and aesthetic form. Aesthetic form might be viewable in ceremonies. Um, for example, uh, we will come back to this idea with Walter Benjamin in a few weeks when we read him and he, he had ongoing interactions with Schmidt. So just keep that in mind. We'll come back to it. Um, Schmidt then turns to Aristotle's distinction between deliberation and action, noting that deliberation requires legal form while action requires technical form. Um, uh, the then this is an interesting to think about. I'm I'm interested in Aristotle because my background is in rhetoric um, to begin with, but in Aristotelian rhetoric, for example, um, uh, he thinks of uh, he divides up the past, the present, um, and the future into different modes or forms of thinking, or forms of rhetoric. So, rhetorical modes we might call these. Um, uh, the past is forensic rhetoric, right? It's like in the courtroom, you're trying to establish what has happened in the past in order to make the decision. The present for Aristotle is called epideictic rhetoric. It's about ceremony. That's where aesthetics, I think, for Schmidt comes in here, right? Even it's, if it's like, if, you know, everybody rises when a judge or enters the courtroom or 
um, they play the national anthem at the beginning of a sports game. That's epidactic rhetoric. If you take a knee at a football game, which has been a recent protest in the United States, that's epidactic rhetoric. But also like traditional speeches after a, like um, like a best man speech at a wedding, that's epidactic rhetoric. Deliberative rhetoric in Aristotle is about the future and it's about politics. It's about making decisions about the future. Um, uh, um, Schmidt wants to distinguish that kind of rhetoric, like about the, the decisions that go into that. And he, and he positions deliberative rhetoric within the law itself, which is interesting. Um, uh, we might switch away it more broadly in terms of politics itself, but, uh, here, at least, Schmidt is situating it in terms of law. Um, and he wants to distinguish it from, from other, other forms, so a legal form of deliberation. And I think that that goes back to his theory of, it's really tied closely to his concept of sovereignty and the decision um, that he wants to place at the base of the state. So decidability on the law there is less deliberation going on perhaps than in a democracy where we might be arguing about like where del deliberation is about what do we do next? Well, because Schmidt is conservative and wants to place um, the sovereign decision with the actual sovereign. Um, and that is not only like the foundation of the legal system, but it's the foundation of the state and it can it has the right in Schmidt's thinking to dissolve the entire legal system to begin with, right? So it's very important to be thinking about like, like where he wants to situate the legal form, um, especially in relation to these other kinds of form um, that we might associate with rhetoric or politics. Um, yeah, we might have debates, political debates about things, but the ultimate decision for Schmidt always already resides with the strong sovereign himself. So uh, he then goes on to say that legal ideas do not realize themselves, but require an organization inter to interpret it. Um, legal ideas do not realize themselves, but require an organization to interpret them, I should say, just for my grammar here, sorry, um, uh, and translate them into reality, right? So the law can be written but it takes some sort of expertise. It takes something else to interpret it and to bring it into realization. Something contradictory, according to Schmidt, happens in neo-Kantian liberal theories that first try to eliminate everything subjective and personal and erect an objective apparatus that has no motivational basis. The end result is the obscuring of the decision itself, yet the decision is fundamentally, fundamentally necessary to law or Schmidt. The decision requires a personality and, quote, should not be mixed up with calculability. In a rational system or a positivistic law, you could calculate and projections about the future based on the past, right? Because you have this whole kind of scientific sort of, sort of basis from which you can base your strategy. Um, but Schmidt has already said in the earlier chapter that what founds the legal system itself is the decision of the sovereign. You need to have that at its base. Otherwise, law doesn't know what it is necessarily based on. Um, even though the liberal positives are going to say it's based on the current kind of uh, social contract, um, on a kind of organic theory is the, 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 the terminology that they will use. And it shows up here in a few minutes. Um, and that that tradition kind of um, just develops over time um, uh, as, as something that erupts from below, um, whereas, of course, in the divine rights of kings and, and earlier um, sovereign-based Euro-Christian theory, then, then the king has a sort of place in this um, theological order of the world. 
So laws can state things, says Schmidt, but they require something else to enact or enforce them. But the liberals have de-emphasized that aspect to such an extent that the state cannot even defend itself, let alone make judgments concerning the health of the public. Classic liberals like Locke said that the law gives authority, but Schmidt says that the law alone is unable to designate who the authority is. Nor can the law alone tell us who is competent to rule or interpret the law. It takes something else. So Schmidt then turns to Thomas Hobbes, um, earlier English um, a theorist of social contract. Um, definitely Hobbes was participating in theories of the state during the, the English Revolution, right? When they've ousted and eventually kill um killed their king and then there's this period um uh in the mid 1600s um where there's no king where there's just parliament and and then the there's the their restoration of the monarchy around 1660 with charles the second right and and this is really important because hobbes's big book leviathan um is being written during this time and, and uh, it first emerges in 1651, and then there's a later edition that he updates and changes some things um, in in around 1668, if I remember correctly. Um, and and that the updated edition is is to reintegrate his thinking back into the restored monarchy. Hobbes, um, uh, in a sense, is is participating in this unfolding of of what will eventually become political liberalism. Um, but 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 he's a much more conservative thinker than someone like John Locke, right? So we see Schmidt going back to Hobbes. Remember, in the earlier chapter, he went back to Jean Baudin, the French thinker, um, and he, um, here he and he turns back to Hobbes. And he says that Hobbes sees saw something personalistic in authority, um, and that he lived at a time when competing sciences did not obscure a direct view of power. So Schmidt here is a here again describing what he sees as the uselessness um uh in talking of powers um that are subordinate to one another um for him and that's that's Baudin from my earlier lecture remember like Baudin thought it was like it was like dumb to have an idea of, of the balance of powers or checks on power that we see in something like the three branch structure in the United States government, executive, um, legislative, and judicial branches, right? Um, and uh, because power itself must be conceived as its definition, which is something closer to force. Again, as I mentioned in my last lecture, that's something that comes up in Machiavelli's thought um, in The Prince and in his discourses on Levy, uh, on Livy, sorry. Um, and uh, uh, it, it's a, a foundational concept, not just for thinking about political theory, but for thinking about law. So later on in this course, we're going to come back and read a really famous essay by Jacques Derrida entitled Force of Law. And that's why I'm emphasizing this right now, because this is a an emergent concept that's going to become important for us as critical theorists later on, but it might seem just kind of oblique, like, oh, here's Schmidt, he's just referring back to um, um, Hobbes. Uh, he also remembered the end of essay one referred to Soren Kierkegaard, and he said that here's a Protestant theologian um, who has a similar articulation of this to me, and I think he's doing the same thing here in terms of a parallel at the end of essay two, where he's turned to a Protestant or Calvinist theorist, right? Um, <clears throat> instead of staying only in the realm of his um, uh, Catholic conservatism. So he says, Hobbes saw something personalistic in authority. He lived at a time when competing sciences did not obscure a direct view of power. Schmidt is here again describing what he sees as the uselessness and talking of powers that are subordinate to one another. For him, there is just power. The checks and balances attempted by liberal states um, merely disrupt and confuse what power actually is for Schmidt. Quote, 
What matters for the reality of legal life is who decides. Alongside the question of substantive correctness stands the question of competence. The juristic form must be personal, not merely technical and disinterested or aesthetic, which may, knows no decision. There has to be somebody or something to tell us what is going on, according to Schmidt. He's saying this over and over and over again. In this second essay, again, if we look back at the essay, what's what's Schmidt's method? He's like, I'm going to bring up um, uh, um, constitutional theorists, and I'm going to bring up liberal um, legal positivists, positivists who are neo-Kantians, dominant positions of his day, um, and definitely some of the writers of, of the Weimar Constitution, and I'm going to say why this is all wrong. Now, why is that important for Schmidt is because, well, we know historically that at least Schmidt was right that the Weimar Constitution, that the, the, the Weimar Republic fell apart. It's a failed democracy when Hitler comes to power about a decade after this particular moment. So, you know, the question is like, like, like Schmidt is right to say that there's some sort of weakness here. Is Sch Schmidt's analysis of the weakness of liberal democracy as a government, a system of government, um, is he correct about that? Um, or, or did the liberal democracy fail for other reasons, right? Um, for the critical theorists and that we are studying for critical theory, the, the, the enduring question, not just in the early 20s, but especially after 1933, is why did Germany not go um, follow what was happening in Russia after the Russian Revolution and the Bolshevik Re Revolution, one might say. But even more than that, if we're thinking about Karl Marx, like Marx's theory of the revolution did not predict that it would emerge in a place like Russia because Russia was much more of uh, an egalit uh, sorry uh, um an agri an agricultural um peasantry like um that um at that particular moment in history and what Marx had said was that the revolution um the of the proletarian revolution would be developed within highly industrialized countries. And so you had to go through the process of widespread industrialization to develop the class that would be the proletarian class and Marx. And then the solidification of that class would then be the thing that overturns um, the bourgeois class um, and establish the new communal order, right? So that's why just like in a strictly Marxian um, sense, like what's happened in the Soviet Union is, is not exactly, although they're definitely informed and, and see themselves in the Marxian tradition, it's not exactly the way Marx predicted it. Um, for the social democrats in Germany, who Lenin in the East hates the social democrats, as we'll see when we read Lenin's book in a few weeks. Um, uh they were to the social democrats in germany are to um status quo um they block the revolution from happening by being trying to ameliorate um the bourgeois class that's in power and so they're basically holding off the action that would um res result in the revolution itself which is what they they want to have happen now the critical theorists the classical theorists of the frankfurt school um are somewhere closer into that 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 middle realm um and yes like in some ways because they read marx and they're trying to understand where marx went wrong or like why did things not happen in germany the way that marx had predicted it they are in many ways relying on marx and they are marxist in that particular sense um, but they're not Marxist in the same way that the that Lenin in Russia is. And it makes them not as extremely left. Um, and um, of course, they're not right-wingers like Schmidt, right? So this is what I'm trying to do in my course by thinking about Schmidt in this time period is um, to situate um, the Frankfurt School um, in a kind of middle ground situation 
And in current critical theory, as I've said in earlier lectures, um, uh, a lot of writers and thinkers have been taking the Frankfurt School to task and saying like, you thought that you were so Marxist, you thought you were so revolutionary, but you really weren't. You were just status quo, right? And I want to just say like, like, you know, thinking about it from the angle I'm, I'm producing this is like, yeah, I think that they were kind of always more middle of the road. Um, but something happens in late 20th century thought, especially in the United States, as the as critical theory be, gets received in the university structure, which is, of course, part of a bourgeois structure, right? Um where they are presented as having more emancipatory potential in their thought than maybe they probably than maybe they ever had, or maybe it's just emancipatory from already within a, a frame of liberalism that accepts liberalism. So the second generation of critical theorists, following people like Jurgen Habermas in the late 1960s, his communicative theory of action, already kind of takes up this position which is a post-World War II position that like liberal democracy is, is kind of foundational for doing and thinking about what communicative theory is. So it already just kind of accepts liberalism as a political economic model. And that's different definitely than the earlier um, critical theorists like Marcuse, um, um, Horkheimer and Adorno, um, these folks, because I think for them, they are in murkier territory like they're writing in between and developing in between the two world wars um yes some of them like hannah arendt and marcusa um uh you know they end up working with the u.s government marcusa works for the office of strategic services on anti-nazi propaganda hannah arendt um, has numerous types of interactions with the state and um that precipitates that turn towards um, critical theory as being sort of situated within liberalism. Remember in my first lecture on Schmidt, I was contextualizing the journal Telos, um, which brought the new left and the Frankfurt School to a wider intellectual public in the United States from 1968 on with Paul Bacconi and the founding of that journal and how that journal starts off as being kind of radical leftist. And then by the late eighties is starting to deal with people like Schmidt and it causes a big explosion in the discourse and the readership of, around that, that journal. In some ways, like that, those kinds of big explosions, um, uh, um, turning one's back a lot because of the, the extremism that's being entertained um, and the, the and the intellectual material, um, in some ways, I feel like precipitates a lot of the the ire um, and angst that develops um, in current broad U.S. political culture, right? Which is not necessarily an intellectual culture. I will say, so I don't want to confuse broader U.S. Um, uh, culture with with um, this kind of high theory academic journal. Um, but uh, those of us who engage with this material, it's like, oh, we see this return to thinking about religion, this return to thinking about Schmidt, which causes a lot of controversy. And then we see the real challenges towards liberal democracy that arise after 9-11 with Hurricane Katrina, with... Uh, the various sort of now we especially see emerging um, destabilizing of the Middle East, not that it was ever really stable to begin with, but the unfolding, ongoing unfolding drama of the Middle East, um, Syria, especially when um, Obama was in uh, office. And then uh, later on the, the retreat of the U.S. from involvement in Afghanistan and Iraq, and that has precipitated an even more destabilization of the Middle East. Um, when, and then last year, of course, the Hamas um, attacks on Israel and now Israel's response to Hamas as, as well over there, right? Um, so this could all be um, conceived um, where, where we're thinking about 
um, states that that um, have some sort of relationship to a declared religious identity. Um, of course, the flip side, you know, the the broader Middle Eastern um, flip side to um, Israel is going to be Islam. So we had an Islamic revolution in 1979 in Iran. And so we have these two states that were declared um, states that have some sort of association with religion that's not a Euro-Christian religion. I think that there's a way to think of the Westphalian state system and I and some of my indigenous colleagues in our own work, which is relevant here, we'll read some indigenous thinkers later on um, who are critiquing liberal democracy from their particular point of view, but we don't want to confuse that critique of liberal democracy with like the Schmidian right-wing critique of liberal democracy, right? So we need to understand what liberalism is, how the critiques come, and how um, the kind of... Uh, the the various spectrum of positions and positionalities that are coming um, in to understand the nuances between the different critiques, um, and so that that's that this is kind of jumping a little bit ahead because this was a shorter it took me um shorter amount of time to get through um, essay two from Schmidt's book so that's where we're going in the future thinking about things like force of law, um, thinking about um, critiques of liberalism from the left thinking about ongoing critiques of what critical theory is in the Frankfurt School as being status quo. Yeah, like uh, this is all stuff to to be thinking about um, uh, right now in, in the complex political um, times that we're in. And I might even say complex political theological times that we are in. Um, but this definitely takes us to the end of uh, um, Schmidt's um, just covering what Schmidt said in essay two here. So we'll pick up with another video just to be consistent. Um, I know this video is kind of short uh, um, with uh, essay three. So thank you for being with us. And uh, thank you for watching. I'm going to stop sharing my screen here. I'm going to end uh, this video. If you are finding this useful, please support us on Patreon um, at the Center for Critical and Cultural Theory. Um, uh, you can find us on the web at cccthory.org. Obviously, if you're a university student and you're paying for this class, um, um, please do not feel it, like I'm asking you to pay any more money um, to support the Patreon page. But, but for those of you out in the world, if you have the means and the ability, this is very much a labor of love uh, for me. Although occasionally I get to teach, uh, I get to get a little bit of income from teaching like a, a class here or there part-time at universities. Uh, thank you and have a great day morning, afternoon, evening, wherever, whenever you are. Bye.